We're now starting to get some serious rules details shown off for the new Black Templar Codex. There's a whole bunch of new rules shown off, a lot of which look really promising, though the Templars have sustained one large and thoroughly expected nerf. Hello and welcome back to Warspets Tactics, the strategy focused 40k channel, where today we're back to review a few more Templar rules that have recently been shown off on Warhammer Community. They've been a little bit stingy with showing us new rules over the past few weeks, but today I think is about the biggest preview of any of the ones that have been shown off. We've got a bunch more details about squads for an example army list that they've given us, two more relic previews, a look at a couple of their litanies, another one of their four army spanning vows, and then a big nerf to one of the Black Templar's most powerful stratagems. Let's go through them all and unpick what it might mean for the army. So first up, let's sort through Strike Force Godfrey, Games Workshop's example army list. It seems to be a narrative list in power level, but it still gives us really quite a lot of good clues as to what sort of things the Black Templars are going to be able to take. First up, it seems that the Sword Brethren's fancy looking pistols are called Pyre Pistols, basically what looks like Primaris Hamflamers. I was wondering whether there'd be an upgraded version of the standard Hamflamer, and that is confirmed to be the case now. I'm going to guess that the Pyre Pistols will likely have extra AP over the Hamflamer, probably AP minus one, and they might well pick up the 15 inch range as well that the Pyre Blaster gets over the Flamer. No idea whether they'll actually be good or not yet, we'll have to see the points cost. Next up we have the rules for that Black Templar Marshal, who appears to be represented by a standard Space Marine Primaris Captain, just with a couple of extra war gear choices. I imagine there's going to be a rule in the Black Templar Codex to give the Primaris Captain access to these options if you play Black Templars. We already knew that his combi flamer was an auto flamer, basically appears to be an auto bolt rifle combined with a flamer, but it's quite nice to know that that power sword is indeed a master crafted one. Strength 5 and damage 2 is just so much better than strength 5 and damage 1. It does imply to me that he's probably not going to get his own data cheat in the codex though, as otherwise he wouldn't just be called a primaris captain in this list. We've got a couple of power levels available. Chaplain Grimaldus has gone up to power level 7 from power level 5. Might be something to do with his increased primaris stat line, and maybe just that he was incredibly efficient already, particularly if he keeps that buffing aura in addition to two litanies. The Emperor's Champion is remaining on power level 5, and it seems that the new Primaris Crusader squads will be power level 10. Talking of those new Primaris Crusaders, this does indeed confirm that you can take 20 man squads as we suspected that they might, and I'm going to guess that they'll be at least fairly rigid in the amount of models that you can take. It looks like we can probably only take a max of 8 neophytes, and up to 12 initiates including the Sword Brethren. It also does confirm that they can at least take all one set loadout, they can all take bolt pistol and chainsword if they want to, the primaris initiates getting the heavy bolt pistol, and I think that that's really quite a helpful touch, not forcing you into taking all sorts of weird and wonderful war gear options. Quite nice just to have a base loadout for the squad, from then you can upgrade if you want to. Finally, it heavily implies that we can indeed take the relic bearers options in non-crusade lists, there's no mention of this being a crusade list, and the assault terminators seem to be paying one power level extra for to take the Sigismund's Seal Squad Relic. I'm going to guess that means that you can take that for one power level or a certain amount of points. Again, it'll still be nice to get some final clarification on that though. Otherwise, there's still quite a lot of other shown off rules. The Crusader's Helm still seems absolutely excellent, and unless you're dead set on taking that vow where you get the entire army in Assault Doctrine all game, I think it'll still be a very popular relic to pick up. It's the one that gives one of your characters an extra 3 inch to their aura abilities, and allows you to put one Templar core unit in the Assault Doctrine during your command phase. Technically it's received a couple of slightly mild nerfs, the aura caps out at only 9 inches now rather than 12, and it's now only locked to core units, not just anything, but it still seems great to me, a massive aura re-rolls or apothecary healing, and it's still great for souping up one of your fighty melee units like Lightning Claw Van Vets or Crusader Squads, and getting them a whole bunch of extra AP. Next up, we have the Litanies of the Devout, which this confirms is definitely still a thing. Basically, Black Templar's six unique Litanies, which they basically get instead of psychic powers. Fires of Devotion remains very similar, with just plus one attack, but the far more interesting one is the Psalm of Remorseless Persecution, which has changed from a reroll ones to wound in melee, to a mad scary sixes causing a mortal wound in combat, but you only get to apply it to a single unit of yours. In melee, those sixes cause one mortal wound in addition to your other damage, and with the amount of attacks that Black Templar Space Marine units can spit out, that is just devastatingly scary. Units with a whole bunch of attacks, like those Crusader squads with the Chainswords, will be putting out loads of mortal wounds on the enemy. Though to be honest, really I see this being used on Lightning Claw Vanguard veterans, as they will basically be twice as good with this rule. They get to re-roll their wound roll, 
so if they choose to, they could get almost double the amount of mortal wounds on the enemy. The amount of mortal wounds that one enemy unit can take from this does cap out at 6, so if you want to actually wipe out squads, it's usually going to be this combined with your own melee damage. But the way that it's worded, it does apply that you could do that 6 mortal wounds to multiple different enemy units. Say you had a max unit of Vanguard veterans with lightning claws, engaged two different targets, you could have a very easy chance of doing 6 mortal wounds to both, just from the additional buff of this single litany. Probably wasn't really needed for yet another good reason to push people even more into taking lightning claws, but it does appear that this has done that. To be honest, they were already pretty good at taking out virtually anything in the game. This will give them a massive damage spike against anything with really high armor saves, or really tough things like Toughness 8 units, and I feel like these Black Templar Van Vets with these might just be one of the most powerful ways that you can fill this already powerful Space Marine unit. Next up, we've got a look at that Sigismund Seal Squad Relic, and another one of their four main vows that they can take, Suffer Not the Unclean to Live. Depending on how much it costs to buy in, Sigismund's seal does seem like it could be really quite powerful. Only one model within the squad gets it, but it grants full melee rerolls for the entire squad against one enemy unit that you pick at the start of the first battle round. Your squad basically gets to just mark a target that they're going to be absolutely brutal against in combat, and if you can manage to catch up with them at some point during the game, then they're going to absolutely obliterate them. I guess it could be quite nice for a unit like Deep Strikey Assault Terminators, as they had in the example list, maybe combined with a Chaplain Litany for the plus 2 to charge to get them out of Deep Strike really easily. It is going to be something that your opponent would see coming though, and I'm sure they'd make at least some effort to make sure their unit doesn't get caught by your hunting one. Their next vow, Suffer Not the Unclean to Live, is another one of these ones that applies to the entire Black Templar detachment. I'm not sure if the entire army will have to be Black Templars to get these, and I'm not sure whether this is going to be instead of them getting a unique combat doctrine. It seems at least plausible that this might replace their unique combat doctrine, giving them the choice of four different quite powerful options instead of just one. The reason that I think that that might be the case is that this Suffer Not the Unclean to Live vow basically gives them one of the benefits of their old combat doctrine, which means that six is to hit in melee, now auto wound the target if you're not in combat with a vehicle. It's not the biggest melee damage buff ever, but it will usually add up to a bit more damage on the target. It gets particularly strong whenever you're fighting anything that's really tough with a unit with relatively low strength weapons like chainswords. I'm going to guess that if this is here, then it certainly won't be part of their unique combat doctrine. So it either means that that unique combat doctrine has changed to be something different, or the vows are just going to replace it wholesale. It's quite nice that you basically get this all game now, not just from turn 3 onwards, but the passion, the downside of this vow, does seem like it could be potentially really annoying. Basically, each time this unit is selected to charge, it sounds like you can declare on whatever units you like, but one of them must be chosen as the closest enemy unit that's not within engagement range of other Black Templars. In general, this might not be the worst thing in the world. If you've just got one big meaty squad of Black Templars charging into the enemy, they're almost always going to want to declare on the closest thing, and then move on to other things as well if they think that they can reach them. However, the biggest issue with this comes if you're trying to do some multi-charges on the enemy unit, say you've got a big squad of fighty Black Templars going forward, and also a character alongside them. Say, if the squad gets into close combat, then the character wants to make a charge. The character will then be forced to nominate a different unit within 12 inches, if there are any other units that are eligible. Say, for example, they could be forced to declare on an enemy character that's screened behind the other enemy unit, and forced to declare a charge that's completely not possible to make. That will basically be a worst-case scenario, but it really could be very, very bad for multi-charging, and make you have to think through your fight phase very carefully indeed, for fear of leaving some of your units out of combat, if you are thinking about doing multiple Black Templar charges in the same turn. I can imagine nothing more frustrating than just having one of your characters have to hang back, because they were forced to declare on something that's 11 inches away from them, and they were very unlikely to get into in the first place. Maybe this is more useful if you're just moving forward with a bunch of really big Black Templar melee bricks, and aren't trying to use multiple small units to assault the enemy army in pieces. The damage buff is good, but I think you'd have to play very carefully to make sure that you don't get caught out by the passion bit. I think this one's certainly going to face some stiff competition from being in Assault Doctrine all game long. Pretty excellent, and while no falling back is pretty annoying, provided your army is incredibly combat focused, that might not be as much of an issue. Finally, we get on to the biggest nerf of the reveal, and to be honest, a nerf that I was absolutely fully expecting. Basically, Black Templar's Devout Push Stratagem was one of the best ones that they had access to, as it allowed you to make some very weird and gamey manoeuvres in the fight phase. I think the previous version of the rule was just written fairly badly, and didn't really let you do what they intended you to do, and I think it was unintentionally incredibly powerful. Basically, what it did was allow you a free pile-in move at the start of the fight phase, and it didn't say whether or not you had to be in combat, 
so you could use it to make sort of pseudo charges or units that wouldn't be able to do it normally. Say units that got out of an impulsor for example, or had fallen back from an other enemy unit, or using it in the opponent's turn as a sort of pseudo heroic intervention. In more competitive play, it was certainly a very big boost to the army. The new version of it though is written quite a lot tighter, and probably I think what they were trying to get at in the first place. You still do it at the start of the fight phase, and it can be your opponent's fight phase or yours. It's now only for core units and characters, and it breaks up into two different parts. Basically, if you're out of combat, you now can't use it to get into combat, as it forces you to make a normal move. Normal moves, as per the movement phase rules, can't end within engagement range of enemy models. If the unit's already within engagement range, you can just use it for an extra pile-in move, if that would be handy. I still think that it's competitively powerful. Potentially, if you're just 3 inches away from an objective, this could be one way to swing yourself onto it. 1 CP for potentially 5 victory points for a primary is really cool. And you could also use it when you are in combat to dictate the flow of combat a little bit better. Say for example, if you'd just been charged by an enemy that was going to try and do some annoying piling maneuvers, you could put a stop to that for one command point and base in their model. I must admit though, it is far weaker than previously. The ability to potentially gain extra combat phases for just one command point was stupidly high value, and you're not going to be able to do that anymore. So, while that might be a major nerf for the Black Templars, I think a lot of the rest does seem like really good stuff, particularly that slightly bonkers litany, with something like 6-12 to 12 mortal wounds from a Lightning Claw squad in a single round of combat. It's going to be interesting to try and put this all together, and I'll certainly review the Codex in full once it's out. If you have enjoyed the video and you'd like to see more Black Templar videos, feel free to subscribe to Orspet's Tactics. I'll certainly aim to do that full Codex review and a review of their other powerful units. Finally, if you have been enjoying the videos on the channel, I would just like to mention that Orspet's Tactics does have a Patreon page that you can find down in the video description. If you've been enjoying the videos quite a lot, any support is enormously appreciated, as it is what allows me to spend so much time making YouTube content. I do try and give some decent rewards to channel patrons, including seeing certain videos early, regular votes to see what sort of things you'd like to see next, and automatic entry into the regular prize giveaways, with a chance to win some really big model kits each and every month. If any of that sounds good to you, or you'd just like to help support, then the link is down in the video description. In any case, a massive thank you for listening, and I'll hope to see you guys next time.